devil. don't know what happened sorry everyone apologies no excuses uh, no explanation somehow I'm off by an hour I, I don't even understand how it happened so for those of you that are here thank you for being so patient something went goofy you know you ever look at the at the clock and you think you got you know five minutes ten minutes 20 minutes whatever but you're off by a complete hour I don't uh, must be early onset Alzheimer I imagine anyways uh, welcome to the live stream. We do this every Monday, normally at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, at least from here on out, that's what it should be. And today we're going to be talking about fingerprint sensors built into the screen of your phone, for one, because that seems to be the new rage, uh, the Galaxy S10 to get Qualcomm's best in-display fingerprint sensor. The OnePlus 6T will also have an in-screen fingerprint sensor in addition to Face ID, if I understand the article correctly. Apple's iPhone event, what to expect that we don't already know? Well, there's probably most of the information has been leaked. They're supposed to have one little secret they're holding back, but uh, who knows what that's going to be. Apple Insider, of course, spills details about almost everything that Apple will be announcing this week, like it seems to happen pretty much every year. More malicious apps found in the Mac App Store. That's right. If you think just owning a Mac is going to prevent you from or insulate you from malware, you are sadly mistaken. And now we have some real world proof that even Apple is acknowledging that a lot of the apps that you get from their store, you gotta be careful with what you're downloading these days. And a first big step towards launching a nationwide flying taxi service by 2022, and why it's questionable as to whether or not that is actually going to happen. All right, let's talk tech. 
Carl, good to see you could make it this evening. I'm, I'm uh, assuming maybe this is a better hour for you. I don't know. Uh, in any case, we will be making some changes to the schedule in addition to today. Uh, on the 20th of this month, remember to put this on your calendar if you haven't already. We will have Nate from Nate's Tech Services joining myself here at a very special live stream presentation, 7.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We are going to be talking about conspiracy theory stuff. So if you're into that, and in fact, if you have recommendations, everyone, I want to ask the chat right now before I even get started, what is your favorite conspiracy theory? You know, whether you believe in it or not, or you think it's just outrageous or it's a crazy idea, put that into the chat. We're, we're going over a bunch of different ideas that we have, and we really haven't decided exactly on which one we want to kick it off with, but I'm always interested to hear what you think. And while you do that, I am going to jump into this first story here. So as you uh, may have heard already, the Galaxy S10 is expected to get Qualcomm's best, I'll explain what that means, best in-display fingerprint sensor. And I, I really think that of all of the innovations that we've seen, you know, within the last year or two at least, probably one of the most exciting ones is this right here. You know, what do we want from a phone? We want a good battery, which every manufacturer, most manufacturers still seem to be challenged by. You know, we want a battery that holds a lot of charge, it charges up quickly, and it doesn't explode inside of your phone. So I guess that's a lot to ask all at once, and especially because we're almost maxed out on lithium ion technology. Outside of that, this article brings up a very good point, and that is that we unlock our phones multiple, I mean many, many times throughout the day, and it should be as easy as possible. So if you're using some sort of security feature, whether it's a passcode, fingerprint scanner, face ID, whatever it is, it should be very simple, right? You shouldn't have to go through a lot of effort to make that work. And one of the downsides of having Touch ID up till now at least has been that it's always located on the home button. So you kind of have to maneuver around and get your finger in the right position. And it's a, it's a relatively small target to hit. So you really have to pay attention to what you're doing. Putting you know the lower third or the bottom half of the screen or maybe the entire screen to function as a fingerprint scanner seems like it would make that process a lot easier. And it sounds like this is what we can look forward to on the Galaxy S10. Not only that, but a better technology um, kind of above and beyond what's available right now. So Samsung, it says, is obviously late to the in-display fingerprint sensor party as multiple Chinese OEMs have released handsets with the sensor in the display. However, they have opted for optical sensors. Samsung has gone with Qualcomm's, uh, reportedly, I need to add, Qualcomm's third generation ultrasonic in-display fingerprint scanner for the Galaxy S10. This is according to Sam Mobile. These sensors work by transmitting an electronic pulse under the finger. So it's a completely different technology in the respect that it reads your fingerprint using a different type of sensor. Now the Galaxy S10, whoops, what did, why did that happen? I hate those kind of ads. The Galaxy S10 may not be Samsung's first smartphone with an in-display fingerprint sensor though. There's a possibility that the company could launch a new mid-range handset in China which would feature this technology. So we may see it before the Galaxy S10 is even released, and this is gonna bug the heck, man. I've got ad blockers on here and I've still gotta deal with this. What is this? Come on, people. I wish they wouldn't do that. Oh, that's so annoying. All right, so let's skip that. Um, that's pretty much what there is to that article. You know, Samsung uh, allegedly, reportedly, including an in-display fingerprint scanner or sensor, that should be available on the S10. To me, that makes a lot of sense. I don't personally use that type of technology. I'm okay with the passcode, but I would think if you were someone who preferred some sort of biometric validation of your identity in order to unlock your phone, not having to fumble around and make sure you're touching the right spot, you know, just picking it up, you touch the screen and it unlocks, you know, instantaneously, that to me would make a lot of sense. So this sounds like a good direction to go. And while we're on that topic, uh, apparently, the OnePlus 6T will also have an in-screen fingerprint sensor, according to OnePlus. So this will not make, obviously, will not make OnePlus the first phone with the technology, but it will be the first phone that will also uh, be widely available in the U.S. So we've heard about this for a while. We know that another number of other manufacturers are doing this overseas. Uh, for the most part, Chinese manufacturers and a lot of those phones we won't ever actually see come to market here in the U.S. OnePlus is one of the few exceptions to that rule, so we should be able to see this showing up. Um, currently, we have Vivo phones, the Vivo 11, the X20+, Plus, the UD, the X21, the Nex, and the Porsche 
design Huawei Mate RS that already feature an in-screen fingerprint scanner. But again, none of those are really something you're likely to come across if you're in the US, uh, which is where I happen to be. So for those of you who have seen it or have access to this, <laughs> look at this. Now my browser is stuck. This is just neat. I don't know what's going on here today. Um, so in April, uh, report, let's see. An April report from financial services firm IHS Markets estimated that by 2019, 100 million phones will carry this technology. So this isn't really difficult to see coming. It makes a lot of sense if you think about the functionality and the ease of use. You know, I would say that if you're using a Face ID, um, you know, system in your phone to unlock you're probably, you probably should be thinking of at the very least having both of these features in future models, which is gonna be a big surprise, you know, obviously, because as far as we know, Apple is moving away from Touch ID, but you know, who knows, they may change their mind and come back to it later on. Um, uh, hello, Global Tech MT, Caesar, how you doing? Love this video, hope to see you soon, man, same. Uh, I think I got something for you, actually. Dave Hammerton. Like the streams, awesome. It's always good to get the validation. I'm glad that I'm just not, you know, kind of throwing information out there and people aren't watching. But when you tell me you enjoy it, I appreciate that. And I'm always open to suggestions and uh, constructive criticisms because I want to make this the best live stream I possibly can, of course. Uh, Johnny Chang, does on-screen fingerprint scanners make the screen replacement more cumbersome and expensive? And that I figured was going to be one of the questions that we would see come up, especially among people here that are in the phone repair business for a long time we've had this dark you know dark cloud kind of looming i'm going to say for the last 10 years everybody's been saying that well you know eventually apple or whatever some company is going to pair the display to the phone that way if it gets broken there's no way that you can replace it and while that is possible i still to this point in time i i think that we're okay for a while for a number of reasons the biggest one being this you can only put so, so much into the display itself, number one. You know, if you were to have something, for example, that ran under the same type of uh, technology that Apple's Touch ID did, where they paired the, the secure enclave inside the home button to the logic board itself, then we know that we have to keep those two things together. But as screens are becoming thinner and thinner, you have to wonder, where would they store that extra circuitry you know it may not even be one specific component it might be a number of different things that work together in order to verify uh, or to keep your phone secure for fingerprint uh, recognition how are you going to fit that into a screen i'm not saying it's impossible it just seems unlikely you know there's always the possibility that they could build that technology into one of the flex cables that's attached to the display but i still to this day have a great deal of confidence in in um, the abilities of technicians. You know, we see every year when we think we're up against something impossible, there will be someone, for the most part, it's usually coming out of China where they say, hey, we've got this brand new tool that solves that problem you've been worrying about. So yes, that is always in the back of my mind as well. You know, we will we start seeing Touch ID uh, built into screens that we cannot separate from the screen and transfer over to a new one? Maybe, but it doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. You know, if anyone were going to do that, it would have to be at this point, it would have to be Apple. Because for any other manufacturer to tell their customers, for all practical purposes, if you want your screen replaced, you have to send it to us. That is not a realistic um, way of doing business. You know, even as of today, there are plenty of people who don't have the time, the desire, the ability, or, you know, even the, the geographic option of going to an Apple store and a lot of people don't want to send their phone in you know it's one thing to have to make an appointment in the first place and wait to have something repaired then on top of it if you don't have you know you've got take take time out of your day go to that store and of course they're going to tell you if there's anything else wrong with your phone sorry we can't fix it you're gonna to have to pay a little extra money now you get a refurbished unit yes I know that there's a certain number of people that are okay with that but for the most part the idea of taking something that is so personal and is so important and that we rely on, it's literally an extension of our brains at this point, and say, you need to drop that in a mailbox and send it in and we'll get it back to you, you know, in a number of days or a number of weeks. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So I don't see how, at least at this point in time, that would be a realistic option. Now, if you had 
an Apple store on every street corner. You know, if you had the same number of Apple stores or, or whatever other manufacturers that were using this technology, if they were represented the same way that independent repair was, where there are tens or dozens or hundreds of phones within a 50 mile, you know, 50 square mile area, and you have all of these options, you could just say, hey, my screen's broken, I need to take it there in, over here and get it fixed, no problem. That, that would make sense. But to say that, no, sorry, you know, the, the closest store that can help you is 200 miles away if you want to get your screen repaired. I mean, who is going to tolerate that? Maybe they come up with some option where they send you a phone first and then you send your old one back in and they have to bill your credit card. But there are a number of logistics that would be more than challenging in my mind to convince people that we're building a phone that only we can fix and no one else can touch it. You know, and that's kind of the underlying um, uh, philosophy here, I think, for phone repair in general. You know, for the, again, for the last decade, people have been saying, well, eventually you won't be able to fix phones. They're getting cheaper. They're getting more durable. They're getting X, Y, Z and all this stuff. And yet every year we see a new bunch of problems that come from each manufacturer where things still break. You know, capacitors still fail. We have screens that get cracked. We have um, charge ports that get damaged. Everyone's eventually going to be going to USB-C, which I think is going to come with some problems of its own. So we'll see. But I, I feel pretty safe right now that we don't have to worry too much uh, for quite a while uh, about getting to the point where we won't be able to replace screens on phones anymore, which obviously is very important because that is our number one repair. Um, hey, Philip Burt, how are you? Hi, first time here, just getting into the business. Greetings from Norway. Hey, cool, that is that is awesome. Someone from Norway, and uh, congratulations on getting into the business. You probably heard everything I just said, which is one of the questions that comes up almost daily, I wanna say on my channel. You know, is this a good time to get into this business? And I, I will say that if you started in the early 2000s, we could have called that the gold rush because you would have been one of the few people probably in your county, if not your state, that could repair phones. Things have changed, obviously. There is more competition, there are more challenges, there are a lot more considerations when it goes into taking this up as a profession, but in my, you know, at least in my situation and everyone else that I've talked to who knows what they're doing, there's plenty of potential to make this a real uh, you know, career right now. So, and I feel safe about that, again, for, for quite a while especially when we consider the jobs that are being threatened by automation right now, the jobs that are being threatened by artificial intelligence. There are, there are a lot of other things that we've taken for granted as careers, you know, as, um, as things that we want to go even get an education for that are going to be going away in the near future. And I think this is pretty low on that list compared to when you look at something any, any company that is doing business is always looking at ways to make more money. And one of the things at the top of the list is, you know, if you've been to a grocery store lately, you've already noticed this, it is to cut hours. It is to get more people off the floor and get more processes automated. And we are in a unique situation where it's not easy to do that right now. And I don't think it will be for a long time. There are, are a lot of other careers out there that are far more threatened, I think, than ours or, or a lot of jobs. Uh, I think the fingerprint scanner is fused to the OLED back with LOCA adhesive. Interesting. The fingerprint scanner, right? But is the is the part that actually process the process the uh, can't speak again? Is the part that processes that information, that data that's being input through the screen, is it located on the display in a flex cable or on the logic board itself? That would be or the motherboard, I should say. That would be the question. Um, that's horrible. What's horrible? <laughs> When will smart devices attain jewelry importance as to keep them in a safe when away from their users? Ah, that's a good question, Johnny, but I, I suspect that most people wouldn't want to be away from their device for any amount of time. That's the impression that I get anyways. Hi, I would like to buy a soldering station. Weller, JBC, or Urso would be the best. Ooh, um, someone else can probably answer that better than I can. As Greg, hey, Greg, as Greg mentioned, Hako is an option but when you're looking at Weller and JBC, you're already considering a price point that a lot of people um, are, are probably not qualified to choose from. So if you have that option, from what I've been told, JBC and Weller, I'm, I'm not from, uh, too familiar with Ursa, but JBC and Weller definitely have great reputations for equipment. I would do a lot of research on that one. And if anyone else here wants to chime on, I don't have hands-on experience with any of those brands. I'm using the Hakka myself. I use a few others. And... 
honestly, for what I do, I think I've got plenty. So, you know, you don't want to spend a lot of money that you don't have to. But uh, it really depends on what you're planning. You know, for me, the, bi the biggest question was, do I want to have something that has a capability of adding the hot tweezers to it? And that's kind of a, bi a big jump in price if you go into something that does support that. And to be honest, I don't use them as often as I thought I would, but they do come in handy quite a bit. So uh, that is entirely up to you. Just definitely do your research and make sure that, you know, that's something you want to commit to and try to talk to someone who's already working with those. I I've heard a lot of good stuff about JVC. I don't know I would like to repair Apple stuff. Yeah, I, I don't think that I've run across a lot of Apple stuff so far that I can't handle. Uh, with the station I'm using. So, you know, we'll find out in a few days what the next thing is going to be. The big difference is going to be, you know, if Apple is going to continue, it looks like they are with this sandwich board design for the logic boards. You're going to need something to be able to separate those two boards from each other. And I just, um, I just got a notification that my DHL package couldn't be delivered today. So I've got to track it down, but I do have an iPhone 10 or X board splitter that I will be uh, bringing on to the live stream eventually. Wow, that chat takes a while to catch up, doesn't it? So that's probably going to be your next question is how are you going to get that logic board opened up? I think that, you know, I'm using the Hako uh, FM 2023, I believe it is, that has the dual outputs on it. And for me, that gets the job done. Get yourself a good hot air station. And, uh, you know, before you drop thousands of dollars, you want you might want to make sure that this is really something that you're you're uh, confident about doing. Quick for hot air. Couldn't agree more, Greg. The Quick 861DW, I'm a big fan. I've been using it for about a year and a half, and man, it never fails me. The other cheap ones don't seem to last as long, although you can get hot air for, for a little less money, but that one's really, really reasonable. You can get it for like under 300 bucks. All right, so what are we expecting from Apple's big launch on uh, September 12th. Well, one of the things we might be ex expecting is one of the phones not to make it on time, but uh, let's see if we can make this a little smaller so I can read it. So it is expected that Apple will remove the physical home button and fingerprint sensor on the new iPhones and replace it with swiping gestures and the face detecting technology found on the iPhone 10, like with that $999 5.8 inch device, screens will get bigger and closer to the edges. So again, for anyone who's worried about not having uh, a lot of phones to work on, as these phones get bigger and the bezels on the edges start to disappear, there is a higher probability that people are going to break their screens. And that is what uh, you know everyone seems to be excited about is having more screen space, less bezel, so unless you get a good case on your phone or, or you're very careful about it, there's a good chance that when that thing goes face down, it's going to crack and or break. And I don't care if you have Gorilla Glass 9, 10, or 12, or whatever it is. You know, glass is glass for the most part. And you can only make it so thick and have it still be able to read your finger, you know, when you're swiping across the digitizer. So I think that that's something we can depend on for a long time. The company may also, the company may also, a larger, okay, these, it's not bad enough that I can hardly speak without making errors, but when they, there's so many typos nowadays, it, it's mind blowing. Okay, the company may also a larger option. I suspect there's a missing word there. A 6.8 inch device that 9 to 5 Mac predicts will be called the XS Max. Yes, if they really do this, it's just going to be funny. The XS Max, really? Killing the previous used, previously used plus labeling which uh, is interesting. You know, we, we expect this every year. There's an S version that is generally going to be the same form factor, but with an increased um, performance when it comes to processing speed, once in a while a better camera, and outside of that, not too much will change. And I suspect that's what we're going to see with the iPhone XC, XS, XX, XS Max. They're not even easy to say, honestly, but... Um, who knows? Now, Ming-Chi Kuo, who if you haven't heard of, he is has been traditionally the most reliable source of leaked information for Apple and supposedly was leaving that, that game of, you know, predicting and leaking Apple information. Well, he predicts, so I guess he's back, that the watch faces on the Apple Watch will have larger screens and we may also see edge-to-edge -edge displays, much like the design of the iPhone 10. Ouch, all I can think of right now is how I am constantly bashing the face of my watch every time I walk by a table because it's just out there, you know what I mean? So if the screen gets bigger on the Apple Watch, we'll probably see more of those getting broken. 
I don't uh, offer any services for iPhone watches beyond the first generation. I don't know if the rest of you do, but in my opinion, they're not a lot of fun. So that's one that I would recommend people get Apple Care or, or some sort of insurance on, you know, uh, if the fine print adds up, of course. Apple may also show off new AirPods, the wireless headphones stored in essentially a self-charging dental floss box. AirPods were mocked by some for its goofy looks, I think rightly so, uh, when it debuted two years ago, but it is a hit with consumers. So like I said, if Apple makes it, it doesn't matter what it looks like. A certain number of people are going to love it no matter what. Hopefully they do something in the design of these AirPod 2s. I really, you know, the big thing hanging out of the ear, do we need that much? I, I think that they can make those look a little better. I've seen quite a few wireless Bluetooth headphones that don't, or earpieces that don't have this big thing sticking out of your ear. I don't know, just my thoughts. Um, let's see, I, I just got a quick TR-1300A. Oh, interesting, I'll have to check that one out. I see Jessa is using an iPhone 10 joiner for the two halves of the iPhone motherboard. She is also valu valuating what amounts to a preheater to separate the halves of the iPhone 10. I hope that uh, this thing that I'm getting has some information along with it because I don't want to have to guess at how to go about doing this. What do you think about Amscope microscopes? Are they good? I would say for the price, probably your best option. I'm using Amscope now uh, pretty much exclusively and you can get you know, really, you don't, you only need so much, and this is the thing. There are higher quality microscopes on the market, but in my opinion, if you go beyond, you know, five six hundred dollars, that's U.S. of course, you're probably spending money that you don't need to. You know, maybe seven at the top, and you can get into a decent AM scope. I want to say for about three hundred ish. So, um, yes, there are higher quality microscopes, but all you need to do is be able to see clearly what you're doing and the magnification that you can get. Um, and really the craftsmanship is pretty solid, so I am a big fan of Amscope. They have to research into transparent aluminum if they continue thinning bezel bezels. Yeah, they give, that'd be a good one. Uh, most people use Amscope. You can also watch, watch Lewis Rossman. He uses Quick and Amscope and Quick. What? He uses Quick and Amscope uh, and Quick for repairing MacBooks, which is another thing you want to uh, consider and probably something I'm leaning towards right now is getting into laptop repair, specifically MacBooks, just because they are so ridiculously expensive and some of the flat rates of repair at Apple are enough to convince people that yes, I don't want Apple touching my, my laptop. Let me get it to someone who knows what they're doing and won't um, take advantage of me, right? That's what I'm seeing. So a little more on this Apple insider information. This is on BGR.com and it says, once again, well-known analyst and Apple insider Ming-Chi Kuo explained in a new research note seen by 9to5Mac that the iPhone XR, which is what he's calling the 6.1 inch LCD phone, is launching in late September, early October due to quality issues of assembly and display. So we may not actually see that entry level or lower tiered, whatever you want to call it, iPhone. I hope that they don't call it the iPhone XC, but there's also a rumor floating around about that. I, I would think that they want that whole C thing just away, you know, let that go and don't don't remind anyone of that. But um, more interestingly, Quo revealed that the 2018 iPad Pro models will come with Face ID support. We kind of expected that to happen eventually, and I would think the same thing will be happening on MacBooks at some time in the future, just as expected, but also with a massive change that we did not see coming. The tablets, the tablets, the tablets will ditch Apple's proprietary Lightning port in favor of USB-C, shipping with the new 18 watt USB-C charger in the box. So finally, we are going all the way over to USB-C. The Apple Watch Series 4 will have slimmer bezels and will support electrocardiography reading. So you'll be able to take an ECG, not an EKG, but an ECG reading from your Apple Watch. Also, the watches will use ceramic backs on all models instead of composite glass, which is probably a good idea. Like, why do you need a piece of glass on the backside of the watch? I don't know, uh, other than if you want it to break, you know, have one more surface to break, but it seems like it'd be pretty safe up against your wrist, right? Uh, let's see, where are we? So one, two, three. Hey, we're doing great on time today, which is good because I had some extra stuff that I might want to add on here a little bit later. But first, the world's uh, more Apple news stuff. Uh, the world's largest carrier spills big 2018 iPhone secret. 
Do you want me to do a saved you a click here? I will. Chinese carriers tease new iPhone with dual SIM support. That is the big secret. This is the big feature that uh, supposedly we didn't know about that hadn't been leaked and yet we've kind of been talking about it for the last couple months. It looks like we will see a dual SIM iPhone for Chinese carriers. Obviously, another thing that won't be here in the US, maybe in the European market and I suspect other places where we have uh, different carriers and networks that are so close together. But for the most part, we don't see dual SIM cards in the US because we don't really have a uh, really a good reason for that. And at the same time, it kind of makes you question if they found room to fit an extra SIM card into this phone and still don't have room for a lot of other things that people are still crying for. Uh, you just got to wonder. Dual SIMs only matter in China. Yeah, that, that's the impression that I got, Johnny. But, you know, for China, that will be, I, I imagine, a good thing. And that's about, that's seriously about all the article says, is that we can expect to see a dual SIM phone from Apple in China sometime. I would imagine September or October of this year. And... More malicious apps found in Mac App Store that are stealing user data. So if you didn't already hear about this, there's an application called Adware Doctor. It was, I want to say it was like the number three of the top selling apps in the App Store for MacBooks. It was the number three app. It was $5 and it was supposed to be an anti-adware app. And guess what? It was, it was getting information from users and somehow sending that information to a location in China, uh, basically spyware for the most part. So Apple has removed Adware Doctor from their app store, but you gotta watch out because it's not the only one. And this is one of the things that, you know, again, there is a certain level of false sense of security when it comes to Apple products in general. I'm not saying that they're not better than others in some ways, but for the most part, if you have a computer, you are vulnerable to getting viruses. And especially when you click the little override button that says, I'm going to get something that's not authorized or doesn't have a valid signature or anything else like that. But this one was really a surprise. We had an app that was um, approved for the App Store and it made it all the way to number three. You had to pay for it. And yet it was collecting your data and sending it overseas to somewhere in China. Malware Bytes reports that in some cases the data is dispatched to servers in China, a country that doesn't require the same stringent storage requirements as the United States or European countries for personal data. In cases like these, it is highly likely the data is being used for malicious purposes. Now, what malicious purposes? I don't know. The only thing that I can really think of, and this was an argument that was kind of put forth when it comes to spyware, is like, what does the average citizen really have to worry about when it comes to spyware. It's not like we have government or military secrets stored on our phone that we're worried about rogue nations getting a hold of. Sure, there's a possibility of ID theft. I think that's probably the most important one up there. But you know, the underlying uh, feeling here is that if you have information that's personal to you, you have, you know, that that's your private stuff and nobody really should be able to get their hands on it. So if you have someone that you don't know, you know, a complete stranger in another country that's watching your your uh, you know your passwords being input or your text messages that you're being sent or anything else on your phone that's personal to you that's pretty creepy right it feels invasive so um with that said here's what the article is telling us again my font is a bit larger than I'd like it to be. Let's see if we can fix this real quick so I can see the whole word on the page. There we go. The app claims to remove adware threats from a Mac, including extensions and cookies in browsers, but Patrick Wardle advises the cleaning process involves collecting the browsing history of the user as well of a, as a list of all running processes and a list of software downloaded to the Mac. Now, why would they want this information? I don't know but it's odd that they would be collecting it, right? The app is also a clone of Adware Medic, which surfaced in 2015 as a copy of an app of the same name, originally created by the developer of Malware Bytes for Mac. A second app, Open Any Files, takes over a system's ability to handle documents that are not associated with an existing app, using the opportunity to advertise other apps that supposedly could open files. While the app was reported to Apple in December 2017, 
2017, it is still available to download from the Mac App Store. So the, the point here being that just because you see something in the App Store does not mean that it stay, it's safe and beyond that, which I'm going to get here into a second, is that you have to keep in mind that anytime you agree to terms and conditions for any type of application, regardless of what platform you're using, it could be iOS, it could be Android, it could be Windows, whatever it is, when you click that little box that says that you agree to their terms, that means that everything that you didn't read, because no one ever does, is now completely legal for them to do. So no matter what it is, if they say that they want access to your photo gallery because you're posting an, you know, you're posting an image somewhere, that means that technically they can have access to any image in that gallery. If they say that they want to have access to your microphone in order to do a voice search, keep in mind that technically would mean that they can have access to the microphone built into your device at any given time. It doesn't necessarily have to be when you're doing a voice search. So uh, all I'm saying is caution. While the Apple's reported, oh, skip that. Uh, Dr. Antivirus discovered through Open Any Files performs simil similar data collection, but with limitations restricted by Mac OS. The same developer created Dr. Cleaner, which again collected data from the user's Mac and sent it to a specific address. So you see a theme developing here. One of the things that has always bugged me the most about anti or you know spy anti malware spyware, uh, whatever you want to call it, is that generally when you install these things, they're very difficult to get rid of. They're always they're always nagging you to upgrade, to renew your subscription, etc. Well, it looks like the same thing is happening here with this stuff. They're all advertised as being ad blockers, uh, you know, malware blockers, something along those lines. And these end up being the applications that are causing problems, that are collecting your data and that are sending it to who knows where <laughs> overseas. Malwarebytes encourages users to treat the App Store just like you would any other download location as potentially dangerous. I think that's the most important thing of this article. I want to say it again. Treat the App Store just like you would any other download location. And that should go for anything that you can get through Windows, anything that you can get through Android Play. You just don't know exactly what you're getting. And it's not the first time that applications have got out, even though they violated the terms that are required for them to agree to in order to get into that App Store in the first place. So it's not up to Apple or Android or Windows or anyone else to protect you. You have to protect yourself. You have to see what these things are doing. You have to be careful of, you know, not only their reputation, but what types of terms you're agreeing to when you install them. And beyond that, even if you don't give them access, you know, even if you get that little thing that says, we're requesting access to your photo gallery and you click no and you click no, I don't want you to have my location information. I don't want you to have access to my microphone it may still find a loophole to get access to sensitive data anyways. This is um, per malware byte. So again, even if you don't agree to their terms and conditions, there can always be some language or some uh, parallel operation that's going on that still allows them to get access to the things that they don't really, you know, or shouldn't probably have access to. Uh, let's see. Is Quick 861 better than Hako Hot Air? I don't know the question, the answer to that one. I've seen a teardown on EEV blog of the Quick, and he was quite satisfied with the build, and that guy doesn't like anything. <laughs> uh, this guy is very annoying. Who, me? Uh, look through Louis Rossman's videos on YouTube. He thinks I use a Hako uh, air station and he switched to quick for his MacBook repairs. If you're talking about EEV blog, I mean, he's got good stuff on there. He's, he's wound up pretty tight. I'll say that he's a very high energy guy, but he's got some useful information on his channel. Um, if you're talking about me, sorry, I, I try not to be annoying, but I may come off that way on occasion. It's not my intent at all. So a 28 person startup took a big first step towards launching a nationwide flying taxi service by 2022. Do you think that this is likely to happen? I, I, want, I want everyone's opinion on this. And I'm still looking for ideas for the conspiracy theory episode. So if you haven't, or if you just joined us, you haven't already seen, this is an open call out right now. If you have a conspiracy theory you want to hear discussed and participate in the conversation, please put it in the chat. Where is it? Over there? No, it's over there, Mike. Everything's backwards to me. So over there in the chat, down on the bottom, wherever it is, put your ideas in there. And also, what do you think about this? A... Flying taxi service in, I don't know what, three and a half years from now? Um, this looks pretty cool. I will say this. You know, when you see the image, 
Uh, this is from uh, Vertical is the company, Vertical Aerospace's company, and it basically looks like a big drone. And this is this kind of makes sense. You know, one of the problems uh, or one of the challenges with having flying cars in general is that how are you going to take these things, have these things take off and land? You know, you really can't use the public roads, so you'd have to have a designated airstrip wherever you're going to be flying this thing, which really means you're going to an airport of some sort, even though the runways might have to be shorter. Well, this would answer that question. If we have cars that can take off and land vertically, we don't have to worry about having that long airstrip, right? At the same time, there are some reasons that I'm, I'm skeptical as to whether or not this is really going to become a reality. And here's why. Uh, actually, I'll get to this in a second. Here's some background. So Uber, it says, is not the only firm that wants to make flying taxis a reality. Bristol-based vertical uh, startup Vertical Aerospace says it wants to provide an intercity flying taxi service in the UK by 2022. Company was founded by tw in 2016 by OVO... Uh, Energy CEO Stephen Fitzpatrick and has now conducted its first test flight. So you can imagine what this thing looks like. I can't play it, unfortunately, because YouTube's real uh, funny about that kind of stuff. I'd have to get permission, obviously, beforehand. But that being said, we have a number of different companies who are getting in on this whole flying car idea. We know that uh, one of the CEOs at Google is heavily interested and invested in these ideas. Uh, we've also got Uber, Kitty Hawk, and Rolls Royce. And I want to say Audi. Uh, if I remember correctly, who are all kind of jumping on this idea of having a flying car. Now the question is, um, if we've if we've already addressed this problem of being able to take off and land these things, that that's part of the problem. But two of you know arguably the greatest minds in the world uh, right now, Neil deGrasse Tyson and Elon Musk, both put forth the same argument when it comes to flying cars, and were fairly dismissive on the on the entire topic for this reason. When you have flying cars in the air, you have two things that we aren't used to and most people will be resistant towards. And that is going to be a lot of noise and a lot of airflow. And this is the thing that we don't really hear discussed too often. You know, if you've ever heard a drone flying before, take that and scale it up times what, I don't know, 20 or 40, and you can imagine how much noise something like this would take. So it's going to be difficult to sell people on the idea that these things are going to be taking off and landing anywhere near uh, residential areas, business districts. I mean, where do you put these things? Maybe on the top of some sort of um, skyscraper like a helipad, right? The same place that you would take a helicopter, I would think would be ideal for using a, a, a type of flying car with a vertical takeoff ability like this. You'd have to have the same situation, right? This is the reason we don't see helicopters in people's backyards for the most part. You know, they make a lot of noise and they displace a lot of, you know, they send a lot of air downwards and you've got this huge mess. You know, if you're anywhere near dirt and dust, which is most places, you're going to have that stuff blowing around all, the, all over the place. So, you know, in their conversations, this is this is really something that made me think, who is going to be okay with these things, you know, outside of an airport or maybe someone who's located in an area that is isolated where you don't have a lot of people to complain about the noise and the downdraft that's coming from these things. That, I think, is going to be one of the biggest challenges. Now, at the same time, there there's obviously going to be a demand for this. I mean, people want to get around traffic. Uh, they don't want to wait in lines. You know, they don't like going across tolls and so forth. So how is this going to work? Is it going to be, become a real thing? Like I said, I'm skeptical about this. It seems like there are a lot of challenges here. And I think this is one that we'd really like to get someone who knows a lot more about this on the stream in the near future. That would be fun. In terms of flying taxis and cars, do you think people are going to get stressed looking up at a cluttered sky? Do we really want the sky, the sky blocked out? Uh, by vehicles. Tony Tiger. Uh, yeah, you know, and that's that's another argument against this. I think that, you know, number one, eventually uh, drones fail, right? I mean, there, there are occasions where the battery starts to get low and the drones can land themselves, but in some situations that's not going to happen. The things can just fall out of the sky. And if you're talking about a full-size vehicle or one that's big enough at least to have a couple of passengers, not to mention the passengers themselves, there are some, uh, there could be some safety mechanisms in place for that. You know, we do know that with helicopters, they can disengage the rotor in a way where it 
spins, I, I want to say it kind of spins the opposite direction or it's allowed to spin freely so that it slows down the descent of the helicopter. And my understanding is you can get a helicopter that's just free falling with no power left in the engine to slow down to about 30 miles an hour, if I remember correctly, and I may be off on that. That sounds like an uncomfortable speed to hit the ground, but it's you know possibly something that people could survive. If you've got something like this and you can accomplish the same thing, that would be one safety mechanism. You know, obviously, what's it going to land on is going to be a problem. And as you mentioned, blocking out the sky, I don't. I, I suspect it will be a very long time before we got to the point where you know there are so many drones in the sky that they're actually blocking out our view of it. But it, technically, that could happen. Are we going to have? Well, I don't know what that is. That was some weird kind of other clickbait on here. And, and this is pretty common. You know, when you look at this cutting edge stuff. Uh, there's going to be an article right behind it that makes you go, really? Am I oh, they're talking about street noodles? Um, is this legitimate? Well, it looks like. I mean, they're claiming that they have a test flight already, so the thing works, which is kind of cool. Uh, are we going to have some sort of air traffic control for these? If you have a bunch of things flying around in the sky, at some point there are enough of them that collisions become a reality, right? So how do we make sure that they don't run into each other? We would kind of expect that by the time these became widespread, if and when it happens, there should be some sort of system built in, uh, most likely most likely an artificial intelligence like we're moving towards in cars that would help these things maneuver around each other and prevent collisions from happening. That, that would be my thinking. Now we'd have to get something along the same lines for commercial uh, and private planes, right? Because I don't know what altitude these things are expected to fly at, but if you have something taking off and landing, obviously we want to make sure that these don't get in the way. We have heard of some time, um, some situations where drones actually interfered with, with real airplanes, so that could be scary. Uh, yeah, just imagine the drivers we have on the roads up in the sky. Yeah, that's a scary thing, Greg. I don't think that we should have most people. I, I, I think that these should be automated. I, if and when it happens, I don't think we want most people manually controlling these. Uh, that would take intoxicated driving to a whole new level, right? Um, I fly drones. Uh, Philip Burn. I fly drones. Just one engine has to fail, and the whole thing will drop like a brick. Yeah, that's no fun. That, that's the other thing. Uh, there's there's got to be a lot of concerns with with if one engine if one propeller stops spinning, the thing's gonna fall. That's pretty scary. Are we gonna be build parachutes into these? I don't know. Um, let's see. Like. The video elsewhere, Windows 95, will be released. <laughs> yeah, traffic jams in the sky. I don't know. Uh, it could happen. I, I think it'll be a long time. I don't, I, I don't, who knows? You know, this this whole technological evolution snowball effect that's happening. You know, it, it really seems as if not only are we advancing, but we're advancing at an increasingly rapid rate. So is there a certain point where we, we reach a steady pace of technological innovation or does it just keep getting faster and faster because as it is right now it's a little difficult to keep up you know things change from one day to the next so maybe uh, maybe this will happen by 22 I mean the world could look a lot different by then I don't know but um, hopefully I'm around to see some of it uh, but I, I don't know about the stuff that's going to be here in 50 to 100 years that may be um, that might be something that I, I'm not ready to adapt to I don't know so bring back the headphone jack why USB-C still doesn't work. I thought we might have a few minutes left over today because I wanted to make sure I got cut up quickly and I thought this was an interesting concept here. So why does USB-C still not work? Well, according to this article, the main reason is that they don't have cross compatibility. Why you can't plug any USB-C thing into any phone and I discovered this recently when I bought, where did I leave it? I think I left it right over here actually. Yeah, so I bought a couple of USB-C cables online, and guess what? They don't work. So why don't they work? Well, apparently, you know, charging is one thing, but when it comes to transferring data, you have to make sure that your specific USB-C cable is made for your specific USB-C device, which is ridiculous because by now we should have a standard where we don't have to worry about this kind of stuff. This was the entire idea behind micro USB. Everyone was going to start building phones that use the same charger. And then we found out shortly after that, yes, they sort of do, but they don't charge at the same speed. And some data, you know, some USB-C, or I'm sorry, micro USB cables 
won't transfer data on certain phones and others and you got and it looks like we're running into the same thing with you with USB-C which is really discouraging. You know, we shouldn't have to buy a new cable every time we buy a new device. We should have one standard something that works, right? Don't you think? Isn't that what USB is all about in the first place? So the first problem he says is lack of basic compatibility. For example, if you take the USB-C dongle that came with the Motorola Z2 Force or Sony Xperia XZ2, it won't work with the Google 2 Pixel, I'm sorry, the Google Pixel 2 XL, Samsung Galaxy S8 or OnePlus 6. The USB-C dongle that came with the Pixel 2 XL will work across all of those phones as does the USB-C headset that Huawei includes with its P20 Pro. So if there's one that does work across all of these different platforms, why doesn't everyone give you one of those when you buy your phone? You would think, and then you probably, second thought would be, oh, I know exactly why, because they want you to buy one of theirs. That doesn't make sense. Um, but take the USB-C dongle that's in the box with the Huawei P20 Pro and try it in your partner's Pixel 2 XL, and again, it's a no-go. Discouraging. And yeah, the USB-C headset that's bundled with the HTC U11 won't work on many phones either. It's enough to make you want to curb stomp your non-working non headset or dongle. And these uh, incompatibilities come down to how each phone maker has implemented its phone USB-C dongle and bundled USB-C headset. And you can imagine um, one of the big problems here is the digital, uh, what does this DAC stand for again? Uh, digital audio... I'm probably going to, oh, digital to analog converter. So the implementation of that feature is the big problem. And basically he's saying that, you know, until you get this straightened out, you probably should just put the 3.5 millimeter analog headset jack back into the phone. And again, one of the problems with sound quality, of course, being that when you convert things from digital to analog, you're going to get a different uh, different sounding output. Although I would argue that if you're using an MP3, you're already on a digital platform. So I'm not sure that that holds up really. Uh, the game of dongles. <laughs> That's great. Ion Throne. <laughs> Name checks out. Game of dongles for sure. Uh, lack of uniformity. Yeah, nothing new. Uh, this is what things do. And, and it's unfortunate that we see this from every generation of phones. We think, oh, finally, everyone's going to get together. We're going to have one thing that's cross compatible. We can stop throwing things into landfills because now you can use your old charger, your old dongle, your old headset with your new phone. Wrong. Again, you get to buy another one. Why? I don't know. Well, I guess I do know. Everybody wants to make money and pretty soon you might have a dongle in the box to charge your phone because there will be no place to plug your phone in to charge it. That will be an interesting one. Uh, yo, take Q training. Take A training. Hmm? Ali Hassan, how you doing? Uh, wait, just wait till Wednesday and Apple, even where they banish the lightning connector and replace with USB-C. Yeah, I, I would not surprise me. USB-C phones that have eliminated 3.5 millimeter jacks. The few that I tried handled it mostly light, mostly right. The Huawei P20 Pro, for example, function as you'd expect. Sony's XZ2 also works just fine with analog dongles, as does Lenovo's Z2 Force. But the exceptions we ran into, including Google's Pixel 2 XL and their new Razer phone, neither include analog pass-through at all, while Google points you to a website where you can buy a digital accessory, of course. So, yeah, that's unfortunate. All right, what else do we have? We've got a few more minutes, so I think we can get one more in here. Uh, IBM used NYPD surveillance footage to develop technology that lets police search skin by color. Okay, um, as we're leading into conspiracy theory stuff, uh, two, two thoughts on this. One, I realize that on the surface, yes, this sounds pretty scary, possibly racist, uh, among other things. And at the same time, when you're identifying pe people's faces and you look at facial features, certainly skin color is going to be one of the factors that come in, comes into play. So again, we're, we're in the situation where, yes, this technology can be used for good or for evil, and chances are it will end up being both to a certain extent, depending on who is actually, um, you know, has possession of it. The crazy thing is that we had no idea that this was going on and that it was using the New York... Um, uh, police department surveillance technology or cameras in order to develop this. 
So the New York uh, NYPD moved to put millions of New Yorkers under constant watch after 9-11. Warning of terrorism threats, the department created a plan to carpet Manhattan's downtown streets with thousands of cameras and had by 2008 centralized its video surveillance operations to a single command center. Uh, the video analytics software captured stills of individuals caught on closed circuit TV. Okay, you get the idea, right? So now, thanks to confidential corporate documents and interviews with many of the technologists involved in developing the software, The Intercept and the Investigative Fund have learned that IBM de uh, began developing this object identification technology using secret access to NYPD camera footage, which is odd, I think, because we're talking about a private corporation having access to a government agency's equipment. With access to images of thousands of unknowing New Yorkers offered up by NYPD officials as early as 2012, IBM was creating new search features that allow other police departments to search camera footage for images of people by hair color, facial, color, uh, facial hair, and skin tone. IBM declined to comment on its use of NYPD footage to develop the software. However, in an email response to questions, the NYPD did tell The Intercept that Video from time to time was provided by IBM to ensure that the product they were developing would work in the crowded urban NYC environment and help us protect the city. There is nothing in the NYPD's agreement with IBM that prohibits sharing data with IBM for system development purposes. Okay, so thoughts on this. Um, can you give me a number, please? Uh, actually, regarding training, I can give you a website. So if you hold on one second, I will do exactly that. In fact, I have got to, uh, I have got to return a phone call about this today. So one second, Ali, and I will give you. Um, I'm actually about to update the schedule, and we will be adding a second um, higher level training specifically for micro soldering and so forth. So um, if you want to hold tight on that, I'll be talking about that in the very near future. So in any case, here's the thing. Uh, you know, and again. Spectacular headlines, clickbait, if you will. So technology that lets police search by skin color. You know, what do you do? I mean, if you have a description of someone, certainly there are going to be a number of factors that you have to use in order to identify them. It doesn't seem on the surface why there's any reason why you shouldn't include things like hair color, facial hair, uh, skin tone, you know, height, weight, etc., and so forth. And at the same time, it, it's it's certainly something to be concerned about when we have a private corporation that's developing this technology and ultimately if it falls into the wrong hands. And this is one of the things that uh, I believe that we need to be careful with and have some sort of oversight when it comes to this because we already are, you know, you know most of the time the whole thing is well. And I had a conversation about this recently. When you talk about things like 23andMe and what's the other company that does uh, genetic, uh, what do you call it? You know, you send your DNA in and then they tell you where you came from, you know, where your ancestry is from. And well, who cares? You know, if they know everything about you, genetically speaking, what your origins are and so forth, what's the big deal? You know, why, why should we have to care about that? And I make a habit of taking things to an extreme in order to illustrate a point. And not that I'm anti, you know, getting your getting your DNA tested and figure out your origins. Hey, that's great. You know, more power to you. And in fact, there's there's a added benefit that we're seeing where they can actually solve some criminal cases, which is great, right? You know, if we can get DNA from family members of criminals and use that in order to track down the perpetrator of a crime. That obviously is a good thing. At the same thing, what crossed my mind is this. You know, if we look at not the state of, <laughs> while some people would argue it's scary enough as is, but not necessarily the world that we live in now, but the potential future. And I think that right now it's more of a concern probably for other nations than it is for the U.S. But ultimately, if you reach a situation where, you know, whether it's fascism or some sort of author authoritarian government or maybe some person who says, hey, we don't want anyone else to be here if they weren't, you know, born in this country or they aren't citizens. Um, once your DNA is in a database somewhere, 
and again, you know, I know I'm, I'm using an extreme example and something that is probably borderline conspiracy theory. So bear with me for that. But if you did, you know, keep in mind at some point in time, not that long ago, we had a country who said, if you have this type of ancestry, we are going to round you up and put you inside of a camp, right? Now, imagine how many more people would have been involved in that process had we had this technology been available in that day and age where everyone had sent it off thinking, oh, I want to find out what my heritage is. And suddenly your ethnicity or your ancestry becomes a scapegoat in, you know, under this regime where uh, the people in power say, you know, we want all of this, pe all of these people removed, or we want all of these people rounded up, and and things like this are happening in this day and age, not necessarily here, but in other parts of the world. If that were to happen, and, and we've already seen examples of where people who live close to the southern border of the U.S. are having their citizenship questioned, and in some cases there have been proposals that they be deported simply based on the fact that they cannot prove because they were not born in a hospital, because they were born to a midwife, which is where, you know, kind of like an at-home birth, that if they can't provide documentation to prove that they were born in the United States, that there are groups, there, there are members of Congress who are proposing that we remove these people from the country, okay? So, you know, while we're not in, this is not Nazi Germany during World War II, but things are changing dramatically. And this is the one thing that I'm always curious to, or, or at least I think to caution people about, you know, under, not necessarily under the current leadership, but potentially down the road, if someone came to power who decided that they didn't like one specific group of people, even if they were citizens, if they had a problem with that group enough that they wanted to remove them from the country or, or, you know, lock them up somewhere or isolate them. Um, having all of this information stored in a database with a private company who is obviously going to provide that information to any government agency, that, you know, whether they need a subpoena or I don't know how that, that process works exactly, um, might be something to think twice about. You know, how much do you want everyone to know about you? And when you swab the inside of your mouth or what, however it is that this process works, you're doing that willingly. And I'm curious as to why it isn't on a more anonymous uh, platform where you send in your DNA and they give you a code and you just type that code in and then you get your answers. Why would you associate your name and your credit card information and your address and your banking and everything else into this database that's collecting information about everything that you are and everything about your ancestors and where you came from and so forth. So just something to think about. Nate, how are you? You didn't get the alert because Mike screwed up today by an entire hour and I, I have no explanation as to what how that happened. My apologies, folks. I'm here at 2 p.m. and now I'm way behind on some other stuff that I need to get done. So uh, YouTube hates you. No, I think that uh, I think that something, something bad happened here. I don't know what. It was my fault though. Um, so Nate, yeah, well, there he is, folks. Nate and I will be doing a stream 10 days from now on a Thursday evening at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. And again, if you're interested in conspiracy theory stuff, that's what we'll be talking about. I am going to stay, uh, I'm going to stay in the chat for a while. So if you have any conspiracy theory ideas for topics, please put them in the chat. We're even looking at obscure, less common stuff that people don't already know or haven't already heard about. Yes, Nate, thank you for reminding me. I got your text and I didn't put two and two together. You're asking me if, if I was going to go live because I was late. And I said, yeah, I'm going to go live at two o'clock. Well, that's what I was thinking in my mind. And somehow I was off by an entire hour. It's the first time. I've never done this before in a year, year and a half. But anyways, 9-11, uh, no airplane. Yeah, that may, <laughs> hey, whatever we come up with, um, it's going to be a lot of fun. I have a feeling it's going to be difficult to end it in an hour. But I hope that you guys will join us. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, talking about something slightly off topic. I have a WEP 852D plus hot air. And what do you think about this station and cheap hot air stations? Are they worth? I actually used that station for quite a while and I did uh, find that it worked well. It didn't last a long time. And this is one of the things about some of the cheaper hot air stations is that they'll, you know, you'll often get a year or two out of them and then they just stop or the 
the heating element dies or if the fan dies and you've got the heat on, the whole thing just burns up. So I think for the price, they're a good investment, but don't expect it to last through your, you know, for several years. That's one of the advantages of getting something like a Quick or a Hako is that not only do they, are they built a lot more sturdy, but they can also be recalibrated. You can replace parts that go bad on them if you need to. So um, those are my thoughts, but certainly, you know, I use one of those little combo uh, hot air stations that has, you know, it's a soldering station, hot air station combo built in together. And those, those, I got a lot of things done with them. So I'm not knocking it. But yeah, as Nate saying, I think this has kind of become the standard for the phone repair industry. If you want to invest a little more money and have something that's got preset temperatures built in, um, you know, a, a quite a variety of nozzles, including the bent one that you can attach to it. You can manually control the airspeed and the temperature. Um, the quick eight, the quick eight six one DW, probably for the money, best bang for the buck, in my opinion. But certainly the other one, uh, it'll get the job done. All right, friends, thanks, thanks again for uh, joining me and putting up with my tardiness. I will try to be on time from now on, definitely this Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard, and then back again next Monday at 2. Mike, put a reminder in your calendar. Don't be late. Talk to you all later. Have a great week.